Our society will never be great until our cities are great. In the next 40 years, we must rebuild the entire urban U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson. As World War II came to a close, the country was filled with joy. Veterans were returning to their homes, to their wives and families. This euphoria was short-lived, though. Another war would soon begin to take shape in urban American cities. Urban cities around the country were becoming more and more crowded, and a public menace began to take shape. This menace was destroying and deteriorating overpopulated urban American cities. Blight, as it is commonly referred to, is a term used to define, classify, and condemn rotten areas or slums of urban cities. Public action committees around the country began spreading this idea of blight much like a plague. These actions helped propel the country into an era of urban renewal. The American Council to Improve Our Neighborhoods, for example, aired a short cartoon documentary that personified blight as a type of monster that sneaks up on neglecting homeowners, slowly destroying their homes. Among the cities polluted with blight was Detroit. A thriving auto industry did not make the city immune. In this short documentary, I'll explore the implementation of urban renewal programs in Detroit's Lafayette Park, formerly referred to as Gratiot. As Detroit's first renewal project, and one of the first nationally, city planners and politicians encountered social and racial obstacles that nearly every renewal program would soon face. While there is no perfect solution to clear slums and cure blighted areas, Lafayette Park is an important example of how urban renewal can revitalize a city by creating economic benefits as well as enjoying a more appealing landscape. In the 1940s, Mayor Jeffries and other city officials set out to bring back the real Detroit, a vibrant city with a rich culture and history of hardworking Americans. In 1947, Detroit's first master plan of the urban renewal era was finalized and published. Next on the city's to-do list was to survey the city and designate certain areas as blighted. Officials quickly came up with a list of priority renewal projects. At the top of that list was Gratiot, soon to become Lafayette Park. Grand visions of a brighter Detroit were imagined and published in the master plan. These visions included comfortable, affordable, and clean living conditions, plots of land for community purpose, and more fluid traffic systems, among many others. After finalizing the master plan and determining project areas, funding was the next step. In 1948, the city had enough money to move forward on the first leg of projects. A year later, the city was jolted with encouraging news. With the passing of the Housing Act of 1949, the city would only have to provide one-third of the total project cost. The other two-thirds would be funded federally. This legislature opened up the doors for other cities around the country that were in the beginning phase of renewal planning as well. Detroit's urban renewal efforts encountered another encouraging sign when Albert Cobo won the 1949 mayoral election by a landslide. The conservative Cobo was enthusiastic about revitalizing the city and would see to it that projects went underway quickly. In May of 1950, city officials began surveying residents of the designated area and found that nearly all the current tenants were black families. The map shown here illustrates the density of the black population in the area in 1940. And here in 1950, 
In this area alone, the city interviewed nearly 2,000 families and 1,000 single persons, almost all of which were black. Along with the surveying of these residents, the city also notified them that they would be forced out of their homes by the government's right of eminent domain, a piece of legislature that allows government entities to condemn housing units of a particular blighted area if it benefits the outweighed negative impact of displacement. What was not told to the current residents, though, was that they were entitled to rights such as government assistance in finding a new temporary or permanent residence. By the middle of 1951, nearly half of the surveyed residents had already left the area and the city had lost track of their whereabouts. Most suspected that they settled in surrounding slums in double or even triple occupancy units. It wasn't long before the Urban Land Institute stepped in and issued a complaint to Detroit officials. They claimed that the city used high pressure tactics to remove families from the area without the proper protocol. The black population certainly wasn't familiar with these protocols of eminent domain and hurried out of the area to find shelter while there was still some vacancy in surrounding areas. The ULI stated that, be that because of the lack of care and prejudicial actions, black families suffered from expensive moving costs, temporary location in unsafe units, and shared occupancy. The City Plan Commission then came up with a relocation plan to assist families in their move. The plan wasn't approved until April of 1952, though, and by then the damage was done and almost all of the thousand families had evacuated the area. The city intended to do good with the families displaced by the project. As you see in the charts, the plan was to triple the amount of desegregated multiple housing units. These high-rise units would be aimed at mixed income families, meaning that they would contain an array of apartments varying in costs. This, in theory, would attract low-income black families as well as white families with higher income. Local builders bidding for the plot of land, however, did not see things working out this way. On July 30, 1952, contractors gathered for the first auctioning of land of Lafayette Park. In a stunning display of prejudice and organization, the crowd remained silent. This protest was a way for them to argue that desegregated housing would not work. Simply put, white families wouldn't want to live in the same complex as low-income black families. A new plan to target middle-income families, black or white, took shape, but wasn't approved until 1955. In 1956, the racial tension from the land clearance had dwindled, and construction on the Lafayette Towers began. In 1958, these two 22-story complexes opened up to the public. The majority of the tenants were middle-class, small white families. Less than 15% of the residents were black. When analyzing Lafayette Park as a case study, along with all urban renewal projects during this era, it is a matter of weighing the costs and benefits overall, in terms of dollars and people. Let's look back at the image of the density of black population in 1950. Now let's fast forward to 1960, and we see just how many people and families were dislocated. In total, the number of families add up to 19,050. The hardships faced by these families, and families like them all over the country, cannot be understated. While Lafayette Park is viewed as a tremendous success, the misuse of eminent domain is one of the few downfalls of the project. To elaborate on the poor practices used by city officials, only 3% of the dislocated families surveyed after completion reported that they received relocation assistance from the city. 80% reported that the experience of relocating had a negative impact on their families' lives. On the other hand, even considering the city's misuse of eminent domain, we can take away many positives from the Lafayette Park project. Here we see how drastically the property values in the Gratiot area, which includes the Lafayette Park, have increased tremendously as a result of the renewal. In addition to the property assessments of post-renewal, experts have analyzed the tax benefits. In the late 40s before the project went underway, experts ex estimated that the tax benefit of the area to the city was just under $5 million. Post-renewal in 1960, the, the tax benefit of the 129 acres of redeveloped land was upwards of $27 million due to the influx of a more productive population. In fact, the influx of a productive population is viewed by many as a major benefit from the renewal project. 
It has helped guide Detroit away from the notion that the only persons willing to live in the city's core were those who had neither the choice nor the means to do otherwise. Another benefit that cannot be forgotten is the aesthetic improvements from the previously blighted areas. Here, we see the greenery and amenities that were added and still exist today to instill a sense of ownership to the new tenants. The scenery surrounded by the towers also provides an incentive for landowners to maintain the land and keep the community happy. Furthermore, the benefits of the project were not only confined to the new tenants. A large portion of the displaced workers from Lafayette Park found themselves in the automotive factories earning a decent wage. In 1965, average weekly earnings for factory workers in the metro area was $151. This, along with the wages and salaries for the rest of the working population in Detroit, ranked first nationwide. During this period of effluence, the need for public housing that was ultimately scratched by the city had diminished. With all of the information presented, the story of Lafayette Park should resonate as a successful tale of urban redevelopment with benefits ranging from a broad fiscal point of view to the aesthetically pleasing land improvements. But it should also tell the cautionary tale of the damages eminent domain can cause if not practiced properly. Let's end by taking a look at some testimonies from the first tenants of the Lafayette Park Towers.